uh, Think Tech Tech Talks. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, Think Tech Hawaii. Today we're going to talk about DR Fortress out near the airport. It's got walls that are many feet of concrete thick. And uh, it has launched a data center virtual tour, which is news. It's an advance. And Fred Rohde, co-founder and president of DR Fortress, is here to tell us about it. Hi, Fred. Hey, how's it going, Jay? Yeah, great to see you. I remember I, I went out to DR Fortress in the early days, and it was something out of um, a movie. It was. You walked in there and you were ready, ready for the action. This was this was high tech, high security in every way. It was, uh, you know, I'll never forget it, actually. Never forget it. And I suppose, as you said before the show, it doesn't look anything like that now. Uh, so let's let's talk about uh, DR Fortress and how it has, um, you know, developed in the past, what, nearly 20 years since I was there. Um, let's talk about, um, you know, what it looked like then and what it looked like looks like now. Yeah, so when we first started, we were Piana Pacific, started in 2000, then we merged with Equinix in 2003, uh, and then we took it over. We did a management buyout, me and my partners, uh, in 2006 to become DR Fortress. So we actually just celebrated our 15th year as DR Fortress, um, and then we decided to do this uh, virtual tour. Uh, mainly because of COVID. Uh, a lot of people couldn't actually come down and, and visit us. Uh, so we put it online and that's um, how it all started. So we just finished our expansion in 2021. Uh, that's on there. And then you'll see all the different um, expansion areas uh, from the last time you were here to today. And uh, I invite you to actually come down and get a real tour when you have a moment because it's definitely changed. Yeah, I will. Absolutely. You know, I consider this a, a great statement of Hawaii's ability to do high tech, to do tech infrastructure. Um, very important that we can do that. Not only is it, um, um, you know, great infrastructure for Hawaii, but it connects its clients with backups in various different continents. Can you talk about that for a minute? Yeah, so we're the hub of the internet for all of Hawaii. So we are the internet exchange. Uh, so we have a switch that all the carriers like Mintel and Spectrum and Lumen and all the uh, local carriers, as well as some Pacific Islander carriers like uh, America Samoa, Telecom Authority, Guam Telecom Authority, Onati from Tahiti, they plug in and they exchange traffic with one another on the internet to keep all the local traffic local. And because we have that um, that hub, uh, we also get uh, the content players like the Googles and Facebooks of the world uh, jumping on that as well. So, you know, they put a caching node inside our data center, plug in, and um, instead of getting like your iOS update from, you know, Kerpentino in California, you actually get it from like an Akamai server in our data center, and it makes the internet fast. So you're not having to go to the mainland and back every single time. And then we also have those specific, you know, Pacific Islander um carriers that will plug in so that they get the same experience and not have to go all the way to the mainland and back. And then we do have um, other international carriers that will bring customers in for DR. Uh, sometimes they're bringing in for, you know, earth station activity uh, for satellites. Sometimes they're bringing in for the telescopes on the big island. Uh, so all that activity is happening downstairs because they're all of our uh, customers are taking advantage of the carriers that are in here as well as the content. You make me want to ask you uh, whether the, the the Tonga incident last week uh, had any effect. Yeah, so we actually got a bunch of emails. I don't know how they were emailing us, but they they, they were trying to do DR. Uh, so they were trying to get up and running. Uh, so I have the sales team working with them as well as some other carriers trying to bring them in. Uh, but they cut two different cables. So I think most of their stuff's going over satellite right now. So those guys are going to be hurting for a while because it's going to take a while to get a ship there. And then they got to go find it uh, where it got cut um, for two different cable systems. Yeah, we hear so much about cables and uh, not that it's relevant, but, um, you know, there was news about the Russians cutting cables off Ireland and off Scandinavia. Uh, it's so interesting how, how important cables are. You don't realize it until you lose one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, there's 
there's more, more coming, but yeah, that's why, you know, you're trying to lower the probabilities and have multiple cables coming in and out. But with, you know, that, you know, act of God, it, you know, they, they couldn't do anything about it because they actually did have two separate cable systems get cut. But if you have to, you can go satellite. It's more expensive, but it's still doable. I know we have satellite functionality. We're out in, in uh, Wai Nai, is it? Yeah, so there's several. There's actually there's one out in, um, uh, yeah, it's like Waianae area, but I think it's all the way up in Kiavaula area. Uh, there's also one in um, like Shark Cove up that that area. I forget what it's called. Um, Pupukea. Mm -hmm. And then if you go all the way around to the um, uh, Kapolei area, uh, where the there's a Hawaii Pacific teleport and a bunch of different earth stations over by the water park. Um, and then I think there's also some um, in Wahiwa. So there's different earth stations depending on where it is. We have one satellite provider uh, called OneWeb. Uh, their earth station is actually on the big island. And then they host all of their equipment here. It's so interesting. You know, you think a, a, a satellite dish would point up into the heavens. But when you go and look, it doesn't point to the heavens at all. It points to the horizon. It points to satellites that are very far away, low to the horizon. Am I right? Uh, it depends on what it is. But yes, you're correct. It, uh, there are some that point straight up, depending on where the satellite is located. And some of them are actually pointed towards Asia uh, because those satellites sit kind of in the middle um, between Asia and us. You can only leave the planet once, right? So <laughs> leave the planet and it comes down and then it hits fiber uh, because if you leave twice, the latency is so high, usually the applications will break. Yeah, it's, uh, but it's, it's uh, comforting somehow to know that even if the cable goes bad somehow, um, we, we have alternatives like the satellites. More expensive, more difficult, but we have them, you know. Yeah. So if I want to be your customer, I can I can bring my server. This is my recollection from back when. I can bring my can I can say Fred, hi, I'm at your front door, which is probably eight feet thick also. <laughs> and I have my server. I want to put my server in, you know, in your facility, or you can provide me with a server. How does that work? Yeah, so uh, several different ways. Again, you can just buy space and power from us, and this would become your data center. A lot of the banks and hospitals do that, um, and you know they they set themselves up. They buy from multiple uh, carriers in here. Uh, they have choice of different networks, like over a dozen of them they can choose. So the price is cheap. Um, if you don't have your own server, you want to go cloud. We do have cloud providers in here. We have a whole cloud marketplace uh, that can do um, you know just a virtual server for you know less than hundred dollars a month and you can come in virtually and through just buying at that point you know ram and cpu and storage on demand and you can get as mix and match of whatever you want for that and then uh they have multiple network providers that go up and then they just charge you uh based on usage you know you must you must over the years have seen an enormous increase in the you know relative use of the of the cloud model um, I mean, so much that I do already is, is I, I don't probably have four or five clouds and I'm just an ordinary guy. Um, and uh, I, I just, you must see that also. Eh? Yeah, so the customers, depending on what they're, they're doing, you know, a lot of them are headed towards hybrid. So they have some stuff they just can't put in the cloud um, and other things that, hey, this application only exists in the cloud. And so usually it's a hybrid of both and it depends on what you're doing. Right. So a lot of times, you know, we're using software as a service on our phones, um, you know, like Salesforce or, um, you know, different applications, social media and whatnot. That all sits in like the cloud. Um, but there's a lot of applications locally for your business that just don't work. Like if it's too far away, your point of sale system like comes to a crawl and the line starts backing up. Uh, so they want it local. So a lot of times what they're doing is they're just sticking it in their office. Uh, but we have cloud providers that actually have dropped in our data center. So you don't actually have to keep it inside your store or in your office. Uh, you can actually use their platform and it stays on island and it makes it extremely fast and your applications will work. And you, you could also, you do also service people who want backup. 
Uh, yeah. I can ha have it anywhere I want, but I, I'm I'm uh, sending to you, and I'm I'm using you as backup, and then you in turn have backup elsewhere. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so we have uh, uh, several different cloud providers that have multiple locations. Uh, so we have one called Cloud Sigma. They're throughout. Um, the US and Europe. And so you can pick a server wherever they're at. Uh, we have another one called uh, Stellar. They're in like four locations throughout uh, the US. And so you can choose a server here and then choose your backup um, in Chicago or Arizona or uh, wherever else they have their, their locations. You actually just pick a dropdown, select where you want that um, content to sit. And again, you can do primary or you can do backup. And then we have some customers that actually do um, active active. So it doesn't matter which one is on, you're going to go to the closest one that's up. Cool. So, you know, I, I uh, think tech has like 70 software pieces and subscriptions that it relies on to do its thing. <clears throat> so I think about software a lot, but you must think about software more than me because you have to stay current on all it's not just a matter of presenting somebody with a with a box and a cable no 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 you have to know about all this don't you yeah i try to stay up on it uh we have a lot of partners that you know they they stay up up on what's happening in terms of what the customers are using, who they need to get connected to. And so I'm in a lot of those meetings. Uh, so I get to, you know, through osmosis, trickle that information, in, like what people are doing, what's hot in the market. Uh, you know, the latest thing is bare metal. So we're going back to what used to be, you know, your virtual private servers. Uh, they can now do that like cloud. So instead of just buying, you know, the RAM, the CPU and um, hard drive space on a platform that's cloud, uh, they can do physical servers that way. So you can have something provisioned within like minutes um, and it's specifically your own server you know, based on how much RAM and storage you want, you click on it and then it's a physical box that it, you actually have access to. So you can even run your own VMware platform and build your own cloud off that bare metal. So all of those new um, technologies usually were uh, kept abreast by our partners and our customers. Yeah, well, you know, it, it, the, your comment reminds me of the fact that um, people use virtual private networks a lot more now than they used to. And um, you, know, you, you sit at what amounts to a dumb terminal. I, they haven't used that term in a while, but it's a dumb terminal. It doesn't do much, but it connects virtually with anything, anywhere, and you're operating some other computer. Um, is, is, it, do you see that happening? Is it happening more? Yeah, so it's always that, um, you know, goes away from you and, and then back to you. So that whole, you know, um, cycle happens where, A, we don't want anything on site. We want to, you know, put it, put everything in the cloud. We want everybody to have like virtual desktops so that, you know, if you lose your laptop, doesn't matter. The content actually wasn't there as on the server. Um, now it's like going back to where, oh, well, I kind of want more power on my, my laptop. I want it available offline so I can be on an airplane. Um, you know, so you're pushing it a little bit closer to the edge, uh, but you're still leveraging the cloud so that, you know, you, you have the the best of both worlds. So it just depends on, you know, what your company and what cycle they're in. But yeah, it, it no longer is dumb terminals. It's usually you're using something powerful. You know, even your phone is like more powerful than what those dumb terminals were back in the day, going back to a mainframe. Um, but it's going to something similar where there's a lot more processing power on the cloud because you're using servers as opposed to, I can't really do the number crunching on my phone, but I need access to that, that data that the server is crunching, but then I need to actually see it on my phone so I can present it to a client or do my job. Yeah, it's really remarkable how sometimes you can't even tell the difference between, you know, programs that run on your machine and programs that are running somewhere else. Uh, the only thing, as far as I can see, is that if it's running in your browser, it's not on your machine. And, and it can do extraordinary things, but it's not on your machine. Anyway, let's let's get uh, down to the virtual tour, okay? Um, so tell us why you did this, how you do, did this, uh, when you did this, and, and how it works. Yeah, so uh, we did this during, uh, you know, we got acquired 90% uh, of our, our 
company is actually owned by an infrastructure fund called GI Partners. They're out of the, the mainland. There's a, over a $30 billion fund, created a couple uh, billion dollars sub fund, and uh, we were their first investment. And one of the board members said, hey, um, because of COVID, why don't you guys do a virtual tour uh, since nobody can go, leave their house, but you know they, they want to see your data center. And so we worked with... Um, a company that actually does it. And they sent the guy that does all the photos for Google in Hawaii. Uh, he came and he did 360 um, shots with his camera, uh, specific uh, sections. We didn't do the whole data center because it, it gets a little bit ridiculous with 50,000 square feet. Uh, but we did some main sections so that you could actually drop in either to kind of watch the video of the, the pictures, or if you want to like click on it, you can spin around and see 360 views of different areas throughout the data center so you can get a feel of the data center. So you're seeing a lot of it. Our uh, engineer is operating that. I wonder if you could give us a, uh, yeah, you so know, a little, little sound to describe what's happening. Yeah, so he's actually in the lobby. And so uh, our customers can actually scan their eyes, come into the lobby, but if they wanna go through a second door, there's a dual authentication process. So they check in with security, they relinquish their ID, they'll get a card, and then they scan their eyes plus a card um, to get through the second door. And then you can actually click, I think, through the door and go to the next area. <laughs> so, maybe, maybe we don't have appropriate permissions. Eh? <laughs> Oh, here we go. He's going back out now. So that's outside. Okay. And then here's another area of the data center. You can actually spin that around and, and, and look down the rows and whatnot. Uh, that's hot oil containment system. So we're not mixing the hot and the cold, but you can see how big the data center is. And this is just one section. So we have, I think, like five sections now uh, that look like this. And it's different technology depending on what the year was that we did it. Um, so that when you come down, I'll show you everything. Uh, but on this um, virtual tour, we just picked certain seg segments so that customers can actually see, like, you know, how big it is and, you know, what the technology is for the cabinets that we're using, hot oil containment, the cable trays and power. So can you go to another uh, segment? Well, it's just another view of the same area. That's the part of the telco room. Over here is a kiosk that they can borrow so they can do their dead on arrival testing of their equipment. They can, you know, we have a lot of customers that are from different countries. They just need a place to want to hang out. We can even run cables to that room so they can actually um, work from there and, and be connected to their cabinet if they want to. And then we have a few other rooms like that upstairs on the third floor. See if you can I have see. three floors in all. Yeah, so there's three different floors. There's two floors of actual data center space. There's a, this is another segment. Uh, we just finished this. This actually looks different now because we had a large 5G um, provider come in and we built them a whole section and they have their own cabinets. Their cabinets are huge. They're like eight feet tall. Normally we use seven feet tall cabinets. Those are eight feet tall. And normally ours are like two feet wide. Theirs are like three feet wide. And they're like 48 inches deep. They're just the giant beasts um, that we actually had to bring in. But this is the newest area that we did. And we could go up to like 18 kW per rack um, in this design. Um, but yeah, we did a really cool floor design. Uh, Rosa picked that out. That's our CFO and my other co-founder. And then for our subroof, we painted it white uh, just to brighten up the place. But um, <clears throat> Like this was in the middle of our build. So everything's not in yet. Hot oil containment wasn't in yet. But now there's like a bunch of like customers in this this area. So it was good that we we got to take a photo before we'd finish. Yeah. Uh, you so, know, I, I don't I don't see a lot of wires here. Um, so is the um, where where are the wires? Are they the floor, the ceiling? Where are they? Yeah, so they're in trays. And so this is actually the UPS room. So we just, um, this is a new uh, lithium ion uh, UPS system. It's a 1.25 megawatt A and B system. So we brought that in. It, it's for, um, it's what cleans all the power to the customers. And then if we were to lose power, it'll hold the, um, the power for the customers for like 45 minutes. Um, after like 13 seconds, it, the generators turn on, synchronize, and refeed the facility. Um, but we have it just in case something happens, um, has a longer ride through. So this is this is different than an ordinary living space. 
And, yeah. I, and I think we should tell people exactly how different it is and what kind of systems you have to keep it um, clean and resilient. Yeah. So, you know, if you were at your house uh, and you'd like turn on the AC, sometimes you see the lights flicker, like servers do not like that. And so <laughs> a server is a computer that doesn't have a keyboard monitor and mouse. It's just the, the processing unit. And you can fit a bunch of them in those cabinets that you saw. And then when you are on your web browser and you're looking at, um, you know, Google, or you're looking at your, whatever you're looking at, you're actually looking at that content that's sitting on a server inside a data center like ours. Um, so what we do is we make sure that the power is clean. So like if the AC is turning on or off, you're not getting that dirty power. So all of it's coming through that UPS or uninterruptible power supply. Um, and we have a huge one, like 1.25 megawatts. That's like enough to power a neighborhood. Uh, we have that just for a little 50,000 square feet um, location. So like we have a million square feet of this park and our little area is like the same amount of power that they use for like the park. So um, it's, it's a lot different. And then you gotta make sure that if we do lose power, um, that UPS will only last for 45 minutes. So you need a generator to actually refeed it to keep it up and running. Uh, so we have switch gear that actually controls if we're getting power from the generator or the utility and it's automated. So we don't have to be here to actually turn them on. It automatically turns on if it loses power and it'll refeed the facility in less than 13 seconds. Wow. So, yeah, that's what the customers are paying for. They're paying for the security, right? Cause we have banks and hospitals and whatnot that you don't want somebody to walk away with your server. Um, and then you're also paying for the cold area that we're trying to keep it nice and cold because servers, you know, if you left your phone inside your car, um, it would heat up and it would shut itself off to prevent the CPU from melting. The servers are the same way. It needs to be at a certain temperature. So it's pretty cold in the data center. You wouldn't want that at your house, but not too cold because you don't want condensation to happen inside the area. Um, and there's a specific humidity um, levels that we try to keep it at. Um, we follow all the ASHRAE standards and whatnot. And then you have all of the carriers sitting inside the data center so that you can plug into whatever carrier you want. Um, and that saves them a ton of money, right? You normally can only get like... Um, Spectrum or Hawaiian at your house um, or use your phone for, you know, your 5G and whatnot. Here we have all those guys sitting next to you and you would physically plug into them. So, you know, we have a, we have one piece of equipment. It's a it's a transmitter and it uses half a dozen modems and and uh, it's Israeli. This thing is quite something. Uh, it's called Live View. It's a professional piece of gear <clears throat> and that the, the half a dozen modems are all bonded up into one high speed line. Sort of, it takes the fastest speed of, of the collective and gives you the fastest speed you can get, much faster than any one single. Are you using that or do, do your customers use that where you bond up a bunch of lines together? Yeah, so they can. So normally what they do is they have a router and usually these routers are huge. Um, like. Spectrum has these routers that are taller than me, and it's like one device. Wow. And, and those are terabit routers. So, um, you know, these carriers are buying and selling from each other inside the data center. So, you know, if you're using that at your office, you're probably, you know, plugging in, you know, 100 meg, maybe gig. So our yeah. customers buy like 100 gig, 1,000 gig. So, so it's just a different scale, right? Because they're actually servicing you at your house. So um, they're having to, to do, you know, 1.4 million people. Everybody's like, using their phone or they're using, you know, their spectrum um, or combination. They're using you know, Wi-Fi at the um, airport. They're using it at the hotels. All of that needs to like get on the internet. And that's where this is, that we're sitting basically at the hub of the internet for all of Hawaii. So those circuits are way bigger than what you can get at your office or your house. Wow. What about the air? You know, I mean, if you have uh, sensitive electronic equipment, do you have to have a certain purity of the air? And if so, how do you achieve that? Yeah, so, you know, we don't allow, it, when they first move in, 
you know, yeah, they're going to have cardboard and whatnot, but we don't allow them to just keep that cow- cardboard out there. You're not having a bunch of paper like you have your, your office creating all this dust. Um, but we have filtration systems that are actually hitting the uh, computer room ACs and it's filtering out the dust. And then we have regular cleanings of the data center because you don't want dust going inside and clogging up. Like if you've ever seen your computer in the back, there's a bunch of dust on that fan. Like it's not good for your computer. And if you, you want that to, to not accumulate, uh, so we have really clean air. Uh, we have customers that uh, need specific temperatures. So we're at 71 degrees plus or minus three degrees. Is that, that's kind of what we're trying to keep the, the data center at. And then we have specific humidity levels that we're trying to stay within as well, because you don't want condensation to happen or you don't want it too dry, right? Because if you walk up and you are statically charged and you touch your equipment, you can fry your gear. Yeah. So we ground out all the cabinets and make sure that the humidity is not too dry or too um, humid. Wow, it's a, it's a whole new world, isn't it? And and the cabinets are all locked. In other words, if I'm company A, I don't want company B getting into my cabinet uh, because it you know it could wreck my whole business that way. Um, so each one is locked, and the and company A has is the only one with access. Is that the way it works? I mean, what what's the the way you separate it for security? Yeah, so they're either in their own cage and they'll have like a key lock or biometrics to get in. Uh, and the other way is a, a cabinet. So you saw all those black cabinets and each one has its own combination lock. And then the customers, um, you know, you, if they let go of an employee, we can go and change that combination lock because, you know, IT in Hawaii is so small. Usually you go from one company to the next. It's the same IT guy coming to our data center, but they're working for a different company. Uh, so they'll call us and say, hey, can you change out our locks and we'll change out the combinations for them? Because they may still have access to the data data center in that area, but then they won't have access to that um, change lock. Yeah. And by the same token, not every not every person can get in. Yeah, it's specific. So we have an online portal. They'll tell us what level of access that individual has. Um, can they bring in equipment? Can they bring in visitors? Can they order services? And we just enforce it. And they keep the log uh, live. And then if they do come in, uh, they do a digital signature. And a lot of banks and hospitals, hey, we did an audit. Who came fourth quarter? We can actually send them that log. And it has everybody's signature that actually logged in for their area. Well, that sounds really you know, important for Hawaii businesses, especially institutional ones who can't achieve this without you and need it, all of it, all the things we've been talking about. But, you know, it's also a statement, as I said before, of the the ability of of our our um, our tech community to provide this kind of service. Are, are you the only one or are there other data centers anywhere close to your size? Yeah, so there are other data centers. Hawaiian Tail has one. Uh, there's another one out by the water park, and then there's one in Mililani. And then I, I, there's a bunch of uh, data centers that companies um, have themselves inside their offices and whatnot. Um, but I think our closest competitor maybe has a couple hundred cabinets. Uh, we're like 600 cabinets and growing. So mm. we we'll do another expansion. Yeah, yeah, I want, yeah, I wanted to ask you that. I mean, uh, this is an this is this business you're talking about has got to be increasing because people rely more and more on computers every day. We know that, and uh, you know it's a it's a center of most businesses to have computing power. Otherwise, they couldn't operate without it. And so uh, they got to be coming to data centers like yours, um, you know, on a, an increasing basis, <clears throat> and that will continue. COVID or no COVID, that will continue. Maybe COVID makes it continue faster, I think. Uh, so the question is, what do you do when they come to you in droves and, you know, you don't have enough space for them or or you don't have enough space for the collective of them, you know, going forward? you got a plan, of course. <clears throat> but what, what, what's the plan? A fourth story? Uh, you have more land? Uh, uh, does, this, does this equipment get smaller as we go forward? The answer is yes to all of that. So the, the, the equipment <laughs> is getting smaller. Um, you can, you have more on your phone now than what you used to have in your laptop 10 years ago um, in terms of the amount of storage you can do. But again, like 
you just use your phone as an example. Like you don't delete any content. You're taking video, you're taking pictures, you're downloading email, emails and whatnot. Uh, and you just don't get rid of that content. You can imagine the scale that companies are doing that, right? Um, how much um, inventory management you're doing, all of your CRM applications, you know, hospital patient records. It's just constantly growing. Your Apple content, your Facebook content, it's just, it never shrinks. It only grows. And even though the equipment is getting smaller, it's taking more power um, and they need more equipment because again, even though it's smaller, it's taking up less footprint, it's always constantly growing. And so we're trying to stay ahead of that. So we just finished that one section that you saw our expansion space last year. And now we're at like 70% capacity, maybe a little bit more like 74. Uh, so we're already looking and our current location where we're basically going to have to move our neighbors um, and pay them to move. Uh, but we're also looking at a second site. So either through acquisition or a purchase of a building and then uh, doing a retrofit. Um, but yeah, we're constantly needing to stay on top of not be not hitting that 80% mark in terms of our, our capacity fill rate. Um, so again, we were at 70, I think 4% when we did our last expansion. And then uh, because of the customers coming in so quickly, we're at that level again. So I'll be doing this year another expansion. This must give you a certain amount of gratification, Fred. You know, I mean, it, it's, it was a roller coaster there at the beginning, but then after a while, you know, you could see this was going to be a big deal. And, um, and you've been there the whole time. How do you feel about that? This is your baby, Fred. Yeah. Uh Everybody asked me when I'm going to retire. I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm too young, but you know, <laughs> I'm getting up there in the years. And uh, my wife wants me to retire, but I really love doing what we do. It, um, you know, we're really impactful for the community. We're one of the pillars for technology. Like I said, we're the hub of the internet for all of Hawaii. And so we're just trying to do like, you know, what's going to impact our generations. We're moving from six, you know, success to significance. And, you know, that's what, you know, gets me up every morning. And yeah, it's super exciting. Yeah, and all those people out there, anybody who would watch this video would say, hmm, I have the internet today. Fred Rohde made that happen. <laughs> I don't know about that. I thought it was important that did that, right? <laughs> so, Fred, uh, I really appreciate you coming down for this discussion. Uh, just tell everybody what your website is uh, so they will know, and, and maybe they can look further. Maybe you can see the virtual tour. Um, what, what, what would be the website? Yeah, so you can go to www.drfortress.com. And oh, thanks. And there it is. And you can also give us a call. So on that link, uh, you can uh, come down for a physical tour. It's actually way better than the virtual tour because it, it will show you everything. Um, and it's uh, 50,000 square feet. So you'll be walking for a while, uh, but it's definitely worth your time. You know, there's nothing like it in Hawaii. So bring your walking shoes when you go to see Fred. That's the bottom line. <laughs> Thank you, Fred. Fred Rohde, uh, co-founder and president of DR Fortress. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Jay. Aloha.